Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to Lazy Road Talk. Good evening. Good morning. Good afternoon. Um, I hope everyone is having a great weekend. All right. So we're going to talk about um, Taiwan tonight. Okay, let's see. Um, all right, I already got questions. All right, I'll address the questions later. Um, all right, thank you. So you probably already know that um, former Ch Taiwanese President Ma ying is visiting China, uh, while the current Taiwanese president uh, is or was in the US um, for a stopover before she went on to Central America. So tonight we'll talk about um, the dynamics China-US-Taiwan relations um, amid the two trips. We will explore um, the Taiwan-China relations as well as the China, uh, I'm sorry, the Taiwan-US relations. We'll talk about what exactly do China and the United States want from these trips. I haven't made banners for my talk, so the so um, for the people who watch my videos later on can actually go to the different sections. I remember to to put the banners on. Um, um, now, before right before Tsai, Tsai Ing Wen's visit, uh, Central American country, the Republic of Honduras, cut eighty two years of diplomatic relations with Taiwan and pledged allegiance to Beijing. And another event, uh, um, of course, that's perfectly timed with Tsai's visit was, um, of course, Ma Yingzhou's, Ma Yingzhou's visit of China. So um, if you look at both events, they're all timed so perfectly with Tsai's visit, right? Uh, so before I talk about, uh, I'll spend the bulk of tonight talking about the two trips. But before that, I'd like to talk about the, the price tag of Honduras' new relations with China. And I have a banner for that. Let me... So, um, actually, I have slides. Here we go. Yes. Um, here you have the post on Twitter by China, Chinese Foreign Ministry spokeswoman and claiming that Honduras chooses, chooses to stand with 181 countries in the world. Uh, she shows an image showing that China has 182 diplomat, di diplomatic relations while Taiwan lost one and it's reduced to 12. Um, so she's trying to show how China has accomplished you know, growing number of diplomatic relations um, successfully. But behind the 102 relations comes with a huge price tag that Chinese people or Chi Chi Chinese people collectively paid um, with their hard-earned money. So I want to talk about the, the price of the Honduras-China relations. At the press conference on at the press conference on March 26, addressing the diplomatic decoupling with Honduras, Taiwan's foreign minister, Joseph Wu, said that um, the Central American country had asked Taiwan for $45 million to help build a hospital and $300 million for a dam, building a dam, and $2 billion to help repay its debt. And then as recent as March 13th, uh, Wu got another email from his counterpart in Honduras requesting the amount of the hospital um, being doubled to $90 million and that the amount of dam also increased. So the total price tag uh, Honduras gave Taiwan for continuing diplomatic relations is a total of $2.45 billion. And Wu said that it felt more like, it felt like they're not asking for a hospital, but they're asking for money. And it felt like a, a bribery. Um, prior to this, Taiwan has has been or had been providing fifty million five oh five zero million dollars uh, aid to Honduras annually. Um, so Honduras raised the price tag what fifty times from fifty million to two point five million to two point five billion. Um, the Taiwanese government did not agree to their rambling demands. 
and they will they decided they will not engage in a meaningless money race with China. So how much money has China paid to win Honduras over? Um, Six billion dollars. That's two and a half times more than what um, what the country, what the South, uh, the the Central American country asked Taiwan for. So, according to information Taiwan government obtained, the amount of money was so large that that China didn't immediately agree to it. And Honduras and China negotiate for days, and eventually they reached an agreement. Till after Honduras agreed to cut the tie with Taiwan. Um, at the timing requested by China, before finalizing the terms of the economic aid, so you could you could see how how you know sensitive timing is to China. So I think everything plays into the timing of Tsai Ing-wen's visit to the U.S. Um, so that's I just want to give you some background information before I get into the the the, the relations. So, so we now have a situation where the current and formal presidents of Taiwan went the opposite directions and are visiting two competing superpowers. And their trips are being described as dueling trips as re reflect the different strategies for Taiwan's two political parties, right? the DPP, Democratic Progressive Party, and then the Kuomintang, or KMT. Um, in gearing up support for their 2024 presidential election, um, so that's 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 the background information. So let's talk about um, what does China want from Ma Ying-jeou's visit, and also related to that question, what the next phase of China relations look like. So Ma ying took off two days for China, two days before Tsai Ing-wen did. Uh, I mean, took off for the U.S. And Ma's visit, historic visit, is um, is an event that Beijing has been designing to create a hedge against Tsai's visit to the United States. Um, but it's not surprising that they choose uh, Ma ying because Ma has been on Beijing's list, top target list for its United Front work um, for years. So um, let me come back. I don't need these slides. In fact, oh, actually, I should show the, this slide now. Yes. All right. So these banners does work, huh? Um, Beijing has never changed its policy towards Taiwan, which which is basically seeking unification through the uh, threat of force. Sometimes Beijing will threat with war. Other times it, it will talk about or it talks about peaceful unification. It has been alternating between the two um, narratives. But one thing the CCP has never slacked off is achieving its uni united front work, aka infiltration. Um, and so Ma Ying-jeou and um, um, Ma Ying-jeou's trip uh, Ma ying and his whole family has been top on the list, on the target list for their United Front's work. His father, who was once the bodyguard of Jiang Kai-shek, has a big influence on, the, on his son, on, on the former president. The senior Ma visited China in 1995 and then again in, in I think, 2005. Uh, I think it's 2005. Uh, Oh, maybe 2015, I'm sorry, either 2005 or 2015. But his first trip was 1995, and that's the more important trip. Um, China sent a few minister-level officials to welcome him, and they arranged him uh, to travel in China and gave almost like a 10 speeches uh, in China uh, at colleges. And in order to make the old man happy, the Beijing officials staged students asking questions that particularly um, please, pleased him. So when the senior Ma returned, he was very happy and he was convinced that the CCP has changed or had changed and was capable or is capable of unifying China. He also urged his son to visit China one day. 
So that's his father. You, you see how his father has a great influence on, on him. So the, the, the United Front work started with the father. And the Ma also has two daughters who worked for a famous Chinese explosive expert. Uh, his name is Cai Guoqiang. And this guy designed scores of fireworks for CCP's major events, including the 2008 Beijing Olympics and the 60th anniversary of the founding of the PRC, and also a number of APEC meetings. So he's believed to have very close ties with the regime because he wouldn't be trusted with explosive work or work involving ex explosives um, at such important um, events, right, the Olympics. So in September 2009, um, which is the occasion, which is like a day before the 60th anniversary of the founding of PRC, which also signified the anniversary of Kuomintang government's defeat in mainland China. That's also the 60th anniversary of the Kuomintang government, the nationalists uh, being kicked out of mainland. Um, now, China state media ran a piece that said, I'll, I'll read it to you, says, the National Day will be celebrated tomorrow. The fireworks were designed by the explosive team owned by, uh, like, I think he's a, he, he mentioned the town where he's from, and his name is Cai Guoqiang, and said the company where Ma Yingjiu's daughters, uh, Ma Weizhong and Ma Yuanzhong, that, that's the names of the two daughters. That's the, the company where the Ma Yingjiu, um, the, 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 pres the president of Taiwan's daughter worked. Um, he said, the, the, press said, the press release said, the company's assistant, English translator and spokeswoman is Ma Weizhong. So basically state media had so much um, pride in announcing that um, the current, the daughters, the two daughters of the current president of Taiwan actually worked for, um, worked on these fireworks show that celebrates the founding of the PRC. Um, think about it. Right. And um, that's just um, that's just unbelievable because the occasion is is it, it, the occasion is a celebration of the event that drove the KMT, uh, the party of which their father is the leader out of China. And that's the type of publicity Beijing loves. There has been rumors that the young ladies, the two young ladies um, job offer was actually brokered by um by CCP agents with the goal to influence President Ma. Of course, I don't think the, the, his daughters knew at the time. So this time when Ma Yingzhu visits China to pay tribute to his ancestors, and he called the trip private, it's actually, a, again, a great publicity for Beijing. Um, because Ma is the highest Taiwanese official uh, ever visited the mainland. Um, because the pre previously the highest ranking uh, Taiwanese official was the vice president of Taiwan, Lian Zhan, and he visited in 2005. Um, before Ma's visit, overseas Chinese language media reported that Ma would be given a, well, a warm welcome at the airport by a Politburo standing committee member at, um, when, he, when his plane arrives. And there's also media report that Tsai Ing-wen's office uh, requested that China give the former president uh, the courtesy that he deserves. However, when he arrived, it was a great disappointment. Let me let me show you the slides. Do I have a slide? I... Okay, so here's the picture of um, Mr. Ma, the former president, his arrival in Shanghai. Um, no red carpet, and um, the 94-word short press statement that Beijing issued for his visit didn't mention any of his titles. It didn't mention he's the former president of Taiwan. Uh, it didn't mention he's the former president of the KMT party. Um, people thought that maybe CCP wouldn't mention the president of Taiwan, um, because that's kind of 
respect in Taiwan as a as a as a state, right? But at least they could mention his title as the former president of the KMT party, because that's what they mentioned when the former vice president of Taiwan visited China. But no, they didn't. They didn't even call him a Mr. Ma. The press statement just addressed him as Ma Yingjiu. And this is very rude, even by CCP's own standard. And so in contrast to the 2005 visit by the vice chairman, here's the picture of uh, the vice chairman of Taiwan, who was also a formal president of the KMT party, you know, he received, uh, he got a, a red carpet welcome. This was, the picture is blurry, it's taken from a video. And he, upon arrival, he also gave a speech at the airport. And the, these were not, the, these privileges were not given to, um, to my angel. And, and the other thing is the person who greeted him at the airport um, was uh, a deputy director from the CCP's Taiwan Affair Office who isn't a CCP Central Committee member. So not only he didn't have a, a standing committee member from the, from the Politburo, he didn't even have um, anyone from the Politburo to welcome him. And he didn't even have anyone from the CCP's Central Committee. He got a deputy minister level official welcoming him. And the vice president of Taiwan even got a minister level uh, official welcome him. His father, uh, when he went to China, you know, his father's uh, official title within the KMT is much lower than, than the son, got several minister levels a level, sorry, minister level officials welcoming at the airport. So people are saying, well, he was intentionally, uh, it was deliberately um, showing some level of disrespect. So the question is, did he know about this beforehand, right? The question is, did Mr. Ma know about this beforehand? If he knew and still decided to go, then he's clearly kowtowing to the CCP. Uh, because he represents the country. I mean, it's not about what kind of respect he deserves. It's about Taiwanese people, because after all, he's a pub publicly elected president of the country. Um, but there's also a possibility that Beijing just changed, single-handedly changed the protocol last minute without notifying his office, which I think is more likely the case here. And that just shows... Um, Ma, Mr. Ma, the KMT, the Taiwanese people, and everyone, everyone in the world, that CCP is not to be trusted. Um, so from Mr. Ma's perspective, his trip is to help the KMT win back the president's office in the upcoming election. On that note, Beijing shares the same goal as him. Beijing is interested in seeing a pro-China KMT candidate running the island and it's trying to convey a message that the KMT is a peacemaker by leaning towards Beijing, while the DPP, um, which is the party that Tsai Ing-wen belongs to, is a troublemaker by leaning against Washington. However, Beijing is very cautious not to show too much support to the KMT to avoid a backfire, uh, because in the past, Beijing, Beijing supported candidates had been perceived as pro-CCP and suffered big losses. So therefore, some people say um, that Beijing is careful not to show too much enthusiasm to welcome Ma because of the lessons Beijing had learned. Well, I think the damage is already done because Beijing's lack of warm welcome can be perceived as by Taiwanese voters as an, as an insult or as a disrespect to their former president. So it doesn't matter what you and I think, it matters what the Taiwanese voters will perceive this. So, um, and many Taiwanese voters are watching how Mr. Ma, I'm sorry, I should get rid of this picture because this is not Ma. Let's get rid of this. Many voters are watching what Ma ying uh, how he ha deals with the CCP. <coughs> Excuse me. So he he did make 
he did make a lot of people feel relieved when he referred to the Republic of China on several occasions in mainland China. You know how Taiwan used a different calendar that starts from the year 1911. So the year ROC, um, that's the year when ROC Republic of China was founded. So Ma Yingjiu didn't shy away from mentioning the ROC year while talking in public. He could have just said 19, uh, 2021, you know, but instead he used the ROC year, which made, you know, a lot of people, I, I don't know, some people, maybe a lot of people happy or feel a sense of relief, at least, at least he was brave enough to utter those words. However, in his speech in Wuhan, his speech in Wuhan was disappointing to many Taiwanese voters. Ma canceled a trip um, in Wuhan to a historic site, but instead went to visit, guess what? A COVID-19 museum. Yes, there's a COVID-19 museum which is a museum that celebrates General Secretary Xi Jinping's great wisdom in pointing the right direction for the country uh, concerning COVID. And there's a video online um, that shows Ma Yingzhou listened attentively and praised China's COVID management efforts like this. He said, the quarantine hospitals you guys built can be said to be a can be said to be pioneering work. This is a great sacrifice. Under the leadership of President Zhang, okay, this is this President Zhang, I think is the president of the hospital, of, of, of a hospital. I don't know which hospital. You have controlled the outbreak well at the initial stage and prevented it from spread from spreading outward on a large scale. This is something we admire very much. This is not just a contribution to China, but to the entire human race. I'm not so sure how people react to that. You know, um, if you think about the number of deaths COVID has caused worldwide, a number of people who have suffered from COVID, I think his remarks could be very troubling. So um, I think this... He, I think this remark may come back to haunt him. I mean, not haunt him, but his his party's candidate um, at some point during the election, because it's just very troubling to hear, to praise China for their effort um, during the in initial stage of the outbreak and prevent it from spreading outward on a large scale. And this is saying that this is something he admires very much. I mean, that's, I think it's going to cause backfire. Um. Now, I want to say the most interesting highlight of his trip um, is yet to come. Uh, this is because he, from this point on, he, he is going to visit his ancest ancestral home. And the Beijing government has already like kind of built the roads or built his family's um, cemetery, shall we say. Um, just to, to welcome his his visit. But I think the most important event that we need to watch out for, which hasn't happened yet, is whether or not he's going to meet with Wang Huning. Uh, remember, Wang Huning is the guy who is now in charge of Taiwan affairs, who is called the brain behind Xi Jinping's policies. Um, the man is also in, he's in charge of designing a new platform to replace the failed one country, two system framework. And so we're saying, um, so a number of China experts are saying that Wang Huni may very likely use this opportunity to meet with Ma Yingjiu and formally introduce the new platform, whatever it's going to be called, we don't know and then use Ma Yingjiu as the ambassador, as the spokesperson for this new platform that he designed um, for Taiwan unification. Uh, because this would be the perfect, Ma would be, because Ma is an advocate of peaceful unification, so he would be the perfect spokesperson for this CCP's platform, right? Rather than have CCP pushing its own agenda 
uh, it would be more advantageous for CCP to have the former president of Taiwan be its spokesperson and 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 promoting its its program platform framework whatever you call that. So we're watching to see if that meeting takes place and if it does take place, if. Wang Huning will use that opportunity to formally introduce this new framework. And I think that will be the ultimate goal for CCP to welcome Ma Yingzhu to Beijing, uh, because it will be, it will be, it, it will, it will significantly help Xi Jinping um, <clears throat> for its effort to win over the Taiwanese population. All right, so now let's talk about Tsai ing um Tsai Ing-wen's trip. It's President Tsai Ing-wen's seventh visit to the U.S. and in the past seven years as the head of state. So to avoid China's reaction, she and her predecessors, like all the the, the Taiwanese presidents before him, have all made have all called the visit private and stayed very low key. So it's all a transit visit or a stopover. It's never an official visit. Uh, when Taiwanese President Li Denghui gave a speech at his alma mater, uh, Cornell University, in 1995, it caused uh, a Taiwan Strait crisis because China reacted. Um, so, in, re in, re in reference to that, this visit, so this visit, um, Tsai's last visit um, as as the head of as the head of state, looks very unusual because although his, the main purpose of her trip is to visit the two uh, Central American countries. People say it, it feels more like he's the United States is her real destination, and um, and then the 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 two Central American countries was was en route. Um, that's what what it feels like. But her trip is different from all the previous trips that she has made. Uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, her plane was escorted by US F-16 fighter jets. And when she was traveling or in air, the US Indo-Pacific Command, IPC, is on alert because of the frequent threat signals that Beijing sent um, ahead, of, ahead of her visit. Um, she stayed at, at the Palace Hotel in Manhattan and attended a welcome reception by hundreds of Taiwanese. Um, and this is very high profile. And she received a Global Leadership Award from the Hudson Institute on Thursday and gave a formal speech. She then took off to visit uh, Gu Guatemala and Belize. And on her way home, she will stop in Los Angeles next week and is expected to meet with the U.S. House Speaker, Kevin McCarthy, and other members of the Congress. Um, in New York, media reported that the, the top Democrat in the House, Representative um, Hakeem Jeffries, already met with Tsai on Thursday. So you can see the combination of all of these events make her trip very special. So what's the U.S. attitude towards her visit? I think very ironically, it, U.S. attitude towards her trip is very similar to China's um, desire of being low key. In me, you know, China wants to be wants to be low key in welcoming Ma. Um, and the United States also want to be low key, low key in accommodating Tsai. Uh, Beijing doesn't want to alienate Taiwanese voters, and Washington probably doesn't want to anger Beijing. So after Tsai's arrival in New York on the 29th, the U.S. State Department canceled a briefing by the Assistant Secretary of State for Asia Pacific Affairs. I think his name is Daniel Crittenbrink. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right, but I do have a picture of him. Um, so you can, if, now here's, here's uh, uh, President Tsai accepting the Le Global Leadership Award at the Huddus, at Hudson Institute. So yeah, this is the US Assistant Secretary of State for Asia Pacific Affairs. So 23 minutes before he was about to hold a briefing, about uh, President Tsai's visit, 
it was canceled. Some say it was postponed, but I think it's it's canceled. And this cancellation caused a pro-China Taiwanese media and President Tsai's uh, opposition party claim that the United States has downgraded its protocol in receiving her. Um, although D Daniel Crittenbrink reiterated on the following day that Tsai's visit does not change U.S. policy and that her stopovers her stopover is is nothing new. People do wonder what made the Biden administration change its its mind last minute. Um, what I wanted to say is, the U.S. government should be careful not to um, the U.S. government, I think, I think they're aware of this, but they, they're they playing a, a balance act because um, there's a risk of being overly cautious um, because it can make the U.S. fall into a CCP trap. I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, I'll talk about that later, but back to Ms. Tai's trip. Um, I think she's not going to meet She's not going to hold any official meetings with the executive branch, but that doesn't mean that such meetings are not held privately. And I think um, I think Biden officials are avoiding any meetings with the executive branch to not to cause Beijing to be overly angry. Okay, now let's talk about the risk of uh, for Washington to be overly cautious. Before Ma left for China, CCP propaganda tuned up its volume in sending out noises about Taiwanese should be suspicious of the Americans' intention in getting involved in, in defending Taiwan. Um, and this propaganda portrays Ma ying and the Kuomintang as peacemakers, while Tsai Ing-wen and the DPP are being taken advantage of by the United States. And so they're the troublemakers. A narrative that's suspicious of US intention has been growing in Taiwan. Uh, it has been ongoing for a while, but recently before Tsai's visit, it has just, it has gone up, it has become louder and louder. What the West should know is that this, this is important. We should not ignore this. Um, there's a historical reason why many Taiwanese are suspicious of the United States, because the Americans did abandon Taiwan twice before. The first was in the 1940s after World War II. The Chiang Kai-shek government had frictions with the Truman administration, uh, which sent the Truman administration sent delegations to Yan'an, the, the CCP's compound. Uh, the home base, and the Americans were deceived by Mao Zedong. The, the U.S. government at the time made the assessment that uh, Mao and his communists uh, and his communists were more popular in China, while the KMT was not. So the United stop the United States stopped military aid to the KMT during the Civil War. And the KMT eventually lost to the CCP and fled to Taiwan. So that was the first time when um, the KMT or uh, many people in the KMT felt that they were abandoned by the Americans. And the second time was uh, in 1979 when the U.S. established formal diplomatic relations with China, with the mainland. Prior to that, the U.S. had promised Taiwan that it would make proper arrangements for Taiwan before establishing relations with Beijing. But during the Carter administration, Americans just ignored Taiwanese, um, Taiwanese feelings or their interests and just directly um, established relations with Beijing. And that greatly hurt Taiwan, Taiwan people's confidence in the US government. And so these are the historical reasons why CCP's narratives um, have tractions in Taiwan, and particularly among um, a lot of people in the KMT community. So it seems that Washington needs to do a better job dispelling Taiwanese fear of being abandoned and dispel their mistrust. Um, 
the the CCP is trying to gain Taiwanese people's trust by discrediting the Americans, right? By trying to sow discord between the the Taiwanese and the Americans. That's what the narratives is all about. And I think the American government shouldn't just ignore that. They need to do something. They need to make effort to 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 gain Taiwanese people's trust because this is important. Um, and I don't know if the the American government is you know has has is is doing something um, on that note. Last but not least, I just want to share with you: in New York, Tsai Ing-wen was met with demonstrators by Beijing outside her hotel with banners that have serious typos in Chinese. Uh, Internet posts said that local New Yorkers Chinese um, are paid fifty dollars an hour plus a lunchbox uh, to go to Tsai's hotel to, to demonstrate, uh, or $100 plus transportation for people from out of state or out of town to, to, pro, to stage a protest. On day one, I think the Chinese consulate hired 500 people, and, and they held various banners, and was reduced to only 20 on, on day two. So similar to Honduras, CCP has been using money to buy support, right? It doesn't, that seems to be the only way CCP, the only method CCP has to, to gain support. It's money. So if it doesn't have money, it won't be so egregious. But I don't know how much money Beijing has left. Maybe the best thing the West can do to help Taiwan is by stop stop um, stopping investing in mainland China uh, because then Beijing wouldn't have so much money to do what it does. All right, so that's my presentation. I hope it's helpful. Um, let me see. Wow, I have a lot of comments. Let me see if, if people have questions for me. I, I want to get rid of this banner. It's It looks kind of annoying. <laughs> Hide. Let me see. Hide. Okay. This is much better. You can see my face. Let me see if people have comments, uh, comments, questions for me. Thank you. Thank you, Malcolm CXDS. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, from David Tsui. Thank you for the super sticker from Malcolm. Let's go Guatemala. All right. That's, that's great. Well, Amy Lai, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your generosity. Um, we trust, laughing out loud, we trust China and Russia. Huh. All right, so let me see. People have any questions for me? Uh, if you have questions, put my name in the front so I know it's addressed to me because there, there's a lively discussion happening here. Um, I don't see any questions for me. Did I lose everyone or did I do that well? It's hard to believe that I did so well. Uh, <laughs> let me see if people have questions. Thank you from Frosty Flake. Thank you, Lei. I feel PRC did damage with Taiwan voters. Yeah, I, I think, I think Ma's visit is definitely. Um, just look at this. You know, I mean, the the way he was treated. Um, was disappointing, right? And also, he was forced to go to, I mean, he, he was forced to go to this COVID museum. I think it was, you know, he had to go. And there, you know, I mean, he had to, he had to say, say something. So, yeah, it's just very, unless you're very strong, you know how to deal with CCP. More than likely, you know, if you're a very polite person and, and a very civilized person, it's just hard to deal with CCP. So my best advice is just not a go because you don't want to be taken advantage of. Um, and so the best thing is to avoid them uh, unless you know how to deal with them because they certainly know how to manipulate you, right? That, for example, uh, when he arrived, when his plane arrived, the bus, the entire bus carrying... I don't know, maybe dozens of Taiwanese reporters. 
you know, mysteriously went lost uh, because they were, because he his flight arrived in Shanghai and then he was taking the high speed uh, train uh, to go to to go to another city. So this the bus load of Taiwanese reporters were supposed to be on the same high speed train with him to go to his his destination, but but mysteriously that bus load of reporters all from Taiwan got lost in the traffic and missed the train, and. You know, I mean, CCP is so famous for its logistics, right? I mean, it's just, it makes people wonder, you know, I mean, if it's intentional. Um, let's see. I do have a question from Ed C. We hear every day that China's economy will crash, but it never does. Why? Uh it's a very good question, and really, the answer is, is not something that 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 I could say in in like two minutes. But two things that came to my mind that I could quickly answer is one: Don't we have the rest of the world uh, keep investing, keep investing in China? Like we have Ma French President Macron going to China next next week and then we have uh, Singapore the head of Singapore's uh, Singapore president um a prime minister went to China I mean we keep have these foreign heads of state that uh that are quote unquote endorsing Beijing or showing signs of confidence in Beijing and then their co largest companies um keep saying that they still want to work with China so if the Western money keeps going into China, that's supporting its economy. That's one reason. And the second reason is in a normal, because it's a controlled economy, the country, the government has access to private money. Uh, any government would be bankrupt by now, but not CCP, because it can, anytime when it needs money, it could directly take private money, embezzle money from, from private citizens and make it its own money. Um, and this is not something any other governments can do. So, and it, it and it, and the country is, you know, one of the top eco largest economies in the world. So, it does have a lot of money. It's not a small country. So, when the private wealth all become all become available to the government, of course, it won't go bankrupt. So that's just my quick answers to your to your quick question, but that question needs probably a couple of videos to answer. From J one 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 one, hi Lei, I know you're really busy and you do great work, but I'd love to see you have Desmond Shun on. I'd love to talk to him. That would be wonderful. Uh, yes, he is definitely one of the top people that I want to interview. Uh, all right, let's. Let's keep that whole, let, maybe somebody can tell him. <laughs> maybe I do come, uh, I uh, do have a way to contact him. So that's a great suggestion. Um, let me see, question from Sinan. How do you think China will handle its high unemployment, um, especially among the young? <laughs> that's a good question. They have... Um, they have all these propaganda coming out, telling people that doing recycling work, doing being a street vendors can be profitable, can make a lot of money. They have all these propaganda trying to tell people to do these odd jobs here and there. Uh, but that's people are not stupid. People know that those jobs don't make them good money. I think the country is running is having the same problem that Mao Zedong had during the. Uh, right, a right after the Cultural Revolution. Uh, right after the Cultural Revolution, China had a lot of young people that the government didn't know what to do. Guess what? They launched uh, a campaign called Shang Shan Xia Xiang. They sent the, the young people away to the, to the rural area. Remember I did the video on Xi Jinping's childhood? That's when he was sent away for re-education. Uh, part of the reason was you have all these. You you stir up all these young people for revolution, for call, you know, to to join the revolution, and then they start fighting with each other, and then you don't give them a job. They're gonna, they're gonna, you know, create more 
you know, really wreak havoc in society because you have large amounts of youth not having a job and they could not having school to go to, don't have a job. And then what are you going to do with them? So that's Mao's solution by sending them away to rural areas. And Xi Jinping may have to do that, you know, even though it's not going to be called Shangshan Xiaxiang, but it's essentially the same thing because right now he has this, uh, you know, a mismatch of labor and then where labor is needed. So he may come up with this massive campaign to send crowds of young people, move them um, into sectors where he needs labor. So I foresee that coming. Yeah, it's very sad for the young people, but whether or not young people will follow that is a different story. Um, thank you, Travel with Love. Oh, from Sumiland, my, my great helper. Thank you for always helping me um, at each live stream. I really appreciate that. Thank you for doing that. I don't even know who you are, but, you, but you're very helpful. Very appreci appreciate that. Okay, so the USA doesn't feel the need to make a show of confronting the CCP over Taiwan. I think President Biden will have someone meet President Tsai. Maybe even he will. I doubt it. I think this, I don't think he will. I think he might send someone to meet with President Tsai, but privately. They're not going to announce it. Yeah, but I don't think Biden will meet with Tsai. Uh, I don't know. Maybe they will, but it's not going to be announced. If that meeting takes place and formally announced, I think uh, I think CCP may be angry. And I don't think Biden is ready to do that yet. I'm not saying he shouldn't do that. I'm just saying that from what I have seen, I don't think he's ready to do that. Uh, from Joe Michaels, what's your opinion on the members of the BRICS using the UN as trading currency? Yes, I notice a lot of American media all of a sudden are talking about um, the dollar losing its status as the uh, reserve currency. And then all of a sudden, UN is being uh, is given the status that that fears the United States. I think this is a hype because how can you how can you trade? with a currency that's not even openly traded, right? I mean, if, if, and so, and if you look at the countries that, the that have this sort of agreement using Yuan with China, they all provide, they all have, they, they provide China with something that China needs, like energy, natural resources, and China provides them electronics, um, you know, machineries. So it's more like a barter uh, because what are, what are these countries going to do with the yuan? Because it's not, you can't trade, it's, it's, it cannot be sold and bought. Um, so what are they going to do with this yuan? They can only use that with China. So I think it's only a nice propaganda, it's nice publicity for China that these countries are willing to help China to gain. But in essence, it's a barter agreement. So China will trade with, let's say, well, Brazil. Is, is, Brazil is one of the BRICS, right? Russia. Um, it's, essentially, it's essentially a trade. Like I give you this, this amount of goods and you gave me this amount of goods because the value, the value is still calculated based on dollar. So they cannot you know, the, how are they going to determine the, the exchange rate? Uh, so essentially, it's a barter agreement. And then the value of the, the barter will be determined by U.S. dollars. Uh, so it's more than what it appears. It's more than what it appears. That's, that's my view. Lei, when are you going to have Gordon Chan to give analysis of the devious wicked doing of the China devil? I don't, I don't know Gordon Chan. Um, I've heard of him. I think he's doing great. So uh, is he doing analysis like I do? I hope he does. I, I don't know. I, yeah. Uh, 
All right. Thank you. Thank you, CXDS. Thank you. Happy Saturday. Su support for coffee and tea fun. Thank you, Travel with Love. I appreciate that. All right. From Marcus Wilson. Hi, Le. What's the one thing CCP is afraid the most? Um, I have an answer. I have two answers. Uh, one is theoretical. One is in practice. What does CCP fear the most in theory is faith. Um, because CCP, communism, the way CCP is running China is like a religion. It's more than a political party. It's, it's, a, it's, a, for, it's a form of a religion. Like the party is bigger than life. You know, it's almost like, like a chairman Mao was worshipped as a spiritual leader. The way everything is set up, you know, the way that's why Xi Jinping always said the party is bigger than anything. The party is, is in control of everything. I mean, in any other country, a political party is smaller than the state. A political party is not bigger than, than the government, right? It's part of the government. But in China, the party is bigger than anything. Um, so, so communism or the, the, the communism that the CCP believes in uh, is a form of religion. So it fears religion the most. It, it tries to brainwash people. It wants people to have faith, to believe in communism. We, only when you blindly receive that, accept that, then you would, then you'll be brainwashed. Then you will accept whatever. You just blindly follow them and then you would accept whatever they tell you. So that's why uh, religion, faith, and tradition is what communism fears the most. That's why you, China has cultural revolution. It destroys anything that's, you know, anything has traditional values and traditional faith. That's just in theory, okay, because it's, it is a religion. It's just not a righteous religion, uh, communism, and it fears other religion. If it's other righteous religion, in pra in practicality, in practice, okay. Now we're talking about present. What does CCP fear the most? Let me ask you. What what is what is the who who okay? Who does the CCP persecutes the most? Is what it fears the most, right? Like, why would, think about it. One is all the ethnic groups, it fears them, right? Uh, like the Uyghurs, uh, at, at one point it also, it's trying to stamp out all the other ethnicities in China because the CCP fear that those people may be unhappy and have an uprising. Whereas the Han people are re relatively controllable, that and also Falun Gong, because Falun Gong is uh, was so popular in China, and it's it still is. You still have like they still have like people from the Chinese military, uh, from the Chinese police force, from like the different ministry within the state council sending like greeting messages to the founder of Falun Gong uh, on like holidays. And you wonder, wow, all these people are still practicing Falun Gong in China, in the military, in, in the police force. And, and, and it's a spiritual practice and, and it fears Falun Gong the most. So if the rest of the world is smart, they should study what Falun Gong has been doing because they obviously have, have done something right to cause such paranoia amongst uh, the CCP leaders. Uh, I, I think that's what, the, that's what CCP fears the most, Falun Gong and then all the other ethnic groups in China. All right, um, from Kay Keith, Trump said last week that he gets along with Xi as well as with Putin and Kim Jong-un. I mean, you can be against CCP and pro-Trump who does personal business with China. 
while insulting Chinese. Uh, you mean me? Uh, well, I think, okay, so pro-Trump has a lot of meanings. I mean, that's a dangerous word that you, that, that you call people. Uh, I'll tell you my honest opinion about Trump. Uh, I have lived in this country for a long time. I I'm not interested in U.S. politics because uh, at the, the local elections, I just don't feel the need to participate. Maybe that's just my Chinese mentality. But the presidential elections, because I've noticed that the U.S. presidents, okay, before Trump, have all don't really understand how to deal with the CCP. Uh, because we've been trying to, uh, all the issues that I'm talking, uh, telling you about now, I've, we've, I've been saying that for a long time. We've seen that for a long time. But the U.S. policy, the U.S. government, seemed don't care about it. But when Trump come, came, you know, I feel like, well, this is, this guy knew how to deal with China because, you know, the, the trade war, he started the trade war. That's my honest feeling. And to be honest with you, as a, as an immigrant, I don't get involved in the politics of the Democrats, the Republican. Um, and as a, as a immigrant, we tend to align with the Democrats more because that's just kind of the, the default, right? The default choice. But when it comes to China, uh, we immediately notice that well, there's finally somebody who can who 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 is not afraid to say something to the to the CCP. Uh, for example, he wanted to ban tic TikTok and WeChat, which is something that we think should be banned a long time ago. Uh, so that's just if you say people are, or I'm pro-Trump, I think I'll give you that's the reason, because precisely because he knows how to deal with the CCP. Uh, because it takes someone a little unconventional to deal with the CCP. I think Biden and, and Tony Blinken, they are, they're exceptional, they're exceptionally experienced in foreign affairs, right? Much more experienced than Trump. But their style does not work with uh, the CCP very well because their their style works with civilized people. Um, I think they did a great job in creating these alliances, uh, trying to contain CCP. I think that's great, but when it comes to dealing with CCP, you need someone uh, maybe stronger, maybe not so nice, somebody who's a little mean. Uh, and and I think when it comes to Trump, he he's not going to be our best friend, but maybe he could do the job to deal with the CCP. That's how I look at it. I mean, he's not going to be someone that I invite to be my friend, but if I hire him, I, I want I want him to do the job to deal with the CCP. So that's what I look at it. But maybe my scope is a little narrow because I'm only looking at you know finding someone who could deal with the CCP. Maybe I'm ignoring other other uh, aspect of the job, uh, that could be the case. But, but he really changed the way the United States government deal with China. And Biden followed a lot of his policies. I mean, he even, when Biden took office, he, he, he suspended the ban on TikTok and WeChat. And now he's walking back. But the difference is uh, Trump just issued an executive order and banned them. Whereas Biden said, I cannot ban TikTok. I need the Congress to pass a law, to, to pass an act before I could ban it. That's the difference. Trump, you may say he's rude, he's direct. He said, oh, I'll forget it. This is not good. I'm going to ban you. Whereas Biden is too experienced in politics. He wants to look nice in front of the Chinese and go through all these legal, the, the right legislative process uh, before he can ban TikTok. To me, why do we have to be that nice to the CCP? Just ban it. So you could say I'm very innocent of American politics, uh, or you could say I'm very narrow-minded, but that's my view. 
We need someone who can deal with China effectively. And all these politics are weighing our, us down. Um, I tell you, the CCP, the CCP, Beijing and Xi Jinping's team, they do not understand market economy. I could say that I could say this fairly confident. No Chinese officials understand, truly understand how to run a market economy. They try to do copy it. They try to do it. They try to introduce elements of market economy, but they have no clue how market economy ought to be run. But they do understand American politics, the democratic process of the United States. They see loopholes. They understand American politics very well. And they have taken advantage of that. So that's just my answer to your question. I hope it's a satisfactory question. Oh, and your answer, uh, he's friends with Putin and Kim Jong-un and Xi, or, or he gets along with Xi Jinping. And um, I, I don't know in what kind of circumstances he said that. Um, I'm not personally against Xi Jinping. What I'm against is CCP and all these things he does. I think he's controlled by the CCP, by the, the communist apparatus, the system, to do what he does. Uh, if you remove him from that job, uh, he could be an okay person to get along with. And if you put another guy in his position, they will be just the same. Um, so it's not him. I'm not personally against him. Some people have the view that, oh, if we replace Xi Jinping with somebody else, then maybe China will become better. No, it's the system. Uh, so I wanna make, make it clear, I'm not against any individual, but I'm against the system that's running China right now. All right, wow. There's a lot of comments. I could hardly catch up with you guys. All right, there are a lot of, there are a lot of, um, uh, okay. Yeah. All right. From from Raul Tai Tian Tianson. I don't know how to pronounce your name. Le, you are well aware of the strategic moves China is doing with Russia and what they are doing in the Middle East with the Iran Saudi Arabia deal. That do you think is reward? Is the reward they rear? I'm not quite sure. I get your question. <laughs> yeah it's it's they're not they're, they're busy they're trying to carve out um, a place for themselves in geopolitics okay um, would China would China All right. Okay, I think I've answered a lot of questions. I like this kind of open dialogue where we can exchange ideas freely. To be honest with you, I, I really do not like to oppose any individuals because we could be opposed. I think opposing an individual is not a very nice thing, but we could oppose the things the person does on his job. Um, and we could oppose a corrupt system that may turn people bad. Um, and I really think people should be open-minded or should have an open mind. And uh, because if once we're very narrow-minded, then we miss the chance of reading um, CCP's agenda. Because you've already have, I think only people who have an open mind uh, can be apprehensive of everything that's happening around them. When you're truly rational and looking, look at things without emotions, without your own agenda, with your own, put on your own lenses, when you truly have no agenda, but 
with the basic criteria of what's good and bad, uh, then you look at then you can evaluate things rationally. And I think that's what the world needs. There are too many emotions right now. There are too many opinions. The world is not in need of more opinions or emotions, but the world is in need of rational uh, assessment and analysis and, uh, and wise suggestions. That's my view. Okay. Um, all right. I think I think I'll take this question last question last question from Silas Larson do the Chinese media ever talk about the Western World Bank and IMF efforts to develop poor countries especially in the 1960s and 80s if so what do they say or do they ignore it I don't know what they say um in the 1960s to 1980s that's beyond my time so um um, I don't know. I don't. Uh, maybe you can ask a more direct questions. I I do not know exactly what you're asking. What do the Chinese media ever say about them? Are they, are they do they think they're good or bad or were they helpful or not helpful? Uh, but the China losing the status of being a developing country will certainly hurt its chances of getting funding from uh, the IMF and the World Bank, right? Oh, I, I do want to talk about this. You know, the the U.S. is passing, uh, passed, not is passing, passed the law that will no longer designate China as a developing country, right? So the, the usually China's foreign ministry will respond will, will respond with a a nasty uh, accusation. But this time it's very quiet. It did not say anything because it's what is what can it say? Because if if it says we do not like you pass, you know, we do not like you um, stop designating China as a developing country, then you you're saying that China is poor. You, you you're still saying China is poor, but this is everything contradictory to Xi Jinping's. Uh, um, the, the China dream, the, the East rising and the West falling, right? So it's contradictory to that. But if it, if it agrees, if it welcomes the idea, then, then it will lose all, the, all its chances of getting uh, the funding from the IMF, IMF and also the World Banks. So that question is impossible to answer. That's why the, China's foreign ministry has been quiet, dead quiet on that. On that on, on, on that law uh, passed by the U.S. Congress, even the little pinks cannot say anything. What are they going to say? They condemn the U.S. or not condemn the U.S. Either way, it, it's wrong. So you see how CCP has pushed itself into this corner that I don't know how it's going to go on from here. Um, all right, so. Okay. All right. So I th I hope I have answered all the questions. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for all the donations, all the donors. I really appreciate that. And thank you, Sumilun, for uh, help me coordinating uh, this talk. And uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend. I'll see you next time. See you next week. Thank you. Bye bye.